Computers keep changing the world, but their power and safety is limited by their rigid design. The T2 Tile project works for bigger and safer computing using Living Systems principles. Follow our progress here on T Tuesday Updates. This is the 48th T Tuesday update. Let's get into it. Last week, uh, we got intertile events working in the limited sense of when everything was all perfect and there was no surprises and everything the way it was, which could be achieved by having loopback cables. So it was really intertile from one tile to itself. And we established the lemonade benchmark, not real benchmark, just an informal number of six milliair, uh, six thousandths of an average of one event per site per second uh, on the tile. Uh, in this past week, I've been working both uh, a little bit on hardware stuff and on software stuff, and I'll talk about both of those. In the coming week, now next week is going to be this uh, biological computation workshop at the Santa Fe Institute. So that's going to take up uh, the time next week. This week, what what I want to try to do is is put myself on the record to find out how to do aluminum machining, CNC stuff, which means since I don't have the machinery to do it, it means finding out uh, who does this sort of thing in Albuquerque that I could maybe visit, that I could phone up and uh, act like a complete ignoramus because once again, I know nothing about this particular thing, just like I knew nothing when I started the PCB manufacturer story and see if I can't start moving the ball a little bit there because we're going to need some kind of frame to hold the power zones four by four array of tiles that will link together and look half decent and be strong. So that's what's coming up. And all right. And so uh, in education and outreach. Oh, okay. So uh, I've been collecting addresses for folks who, who want to get some of the commemorative uh, uh, Hardware Land 2019 T2 tile stickers. If you want to get in on that, or at least if you want to get in on the, the first mailing of it, uh, get an email, uh, get a physical mail address to me that probably the easiest thing to do is to go to the Gitter and do a direct message. But if that if doesn't work because you don't like that, whatever it is, you can find an email address for me using your internet skills. Uh, uh, most addresses that you can find that are obviously about me, they will work. Uh, uh, and get me a physical address. I, I guess I'll send them out after the Santa Fe uh, Biological Workshop next week. Uh, in addition, uh, Andrew Walpole, lead communications for the T2 Tile Project. Uh, uh, I got some new swag. <laughs> uh, uh, do I have it right side up? Oh, yeah, I do. The T2 Tile. Uh, car by event window on the back. When life gets too tough, when the bugs are too hard, when the performance is too slow. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. All right. Uh, um, okay, hardware. So it's about the back of the hardware. You've seen this uh, tile before. Longtime watchers know what this tile is. It's the Keymaster. How do you know? It's in white. Well, what, what you may not know is, in fact, just like uh, kids and animals in movies, this is not the only Keymaster that has ever existed. In fact, we are now on the third PCB, on the third uh, circuit board for the same BeagleBone. So it started out uh, originally the Keymaster was E15. This goes all the way back to April when we were getting them manufactured at ETS. This is the E series of titles because they were made by ETS. And at some point, uh, that tile uh, went bad. Something was wrong with the Northwest connection. I don't know what it was. So I took the beagle bone off it and I mounted it on E224. And this past week, that went bad. And so now the Keymaster, even though it still has the same white case, in fact, is on E225. And, you know, I didn't know whether to say this is a problem with manufacturing, but increasingly, it seems to me, it's a problem with having the these exposed pins on the back. Uh, uh, strange Hardware uh, made a comment last week, thank you, uh, uh, pointing out the probably the obvious point. Sounds like you need to print some back plates to avoid touching those exposed pins. And you know, it's a, it's, it's a real problem with these things because you know, when they're just like this, you know, I, I don't actually worry that much about static electricity and so forth, just because I've never had any real issues with it, even though people want to sell you these static straps and static mats and all of this stuff. It hasn't been a problem for me. But when we're talking about hot swapping one of these things or, you know, hooking up 
hooking them together while they're powered up. Or for example, pushing a, an intertile connector or a ribbon cable into one of these things while it's powered up, you want something to push against and you end up going like that and your finger is right on the exposed pins which number one isn't very comfortable but number two it's making electrical contact of some degree depending on how moist your skin is and so forth between pins that aren't supposed to be connected so yeah absolutely need something and you know the problem is is you know we've already got these nice feet that are all kind of measured out and i didn't want to mess with them and so and there really isn't a lot of thread left on the feet uh, socket screws anyway but then i realized well we've got these four as well these are the four screws from the brass standoffs that hold the uh, beagle bones in position and so it's like this so here you know here's a special one doesn't have any parts mounted on it so the beagle bone has these you know these four brass standoffs that we mount on that and then it goes in the holes and so i've been using these these nuts that long time viewers recall these are the nuts from dubai uh, um to hold the brass standoffs on but i don't like it because they loosen up and i knew that down the road i was going to have to use a a, 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 a lock wire or some Loctite or something like that. It was another step. I didn't like it. Say, so, well, hey, why don't I just get rid of these nuts and have a back plate that would self-tap onto those brass standoffs? So uh, I started designing it um, and, uh, you know, printing up a bunch of uh, uh, things, trying to get the uh, position of the holes and all the stuff right so it was everything was covered that wanted to be covered without covering up everything because I wanted to keep as much of the nice uh, circuit board available as I could. Guess what happened next? Oh yeah, I was tr just trying to line up the positions, get the holes all right. Yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> Next, uh, uh, once again, longtime viewers know the story of this. Oh my goodness! Uh, um, so you know what I should have done is unpack the Ender Three that I got a brand new printer, a uh, three uh, D printer, and get that set up and taken this as a thing. But I took the path of least resistance, and instead I went back and looked at the connections I had done before. This uh, this uh, fuzzy thing at the beginning here in the front—that's one of the uh, uh, thermal t temperature sensor wires that I repaired. This is the, the yellow fuzzy thing in the back background is the other one you know I just used regular hookup wire to, to connect these things up because I figured how bad could it be but it failed again so this time I was like uh, no uh, uh, and I went <laughs> I had I had bought this wire, this super worm wire, that is meant for uh, ra uh, radio control racing vehicles, and it's super thick and super floppy, and it's zillions of incredibly fine copper threads in it, because um, it's meant to take vibrations and all kinds of stuff, and a lot of high current, and I used a couple of pieces of this, which I had gotten for evaluating an alternate solution for powering the boards long ago, uh, uh, so I took a couple lengths of this and replaced Place the the thermal the thermistor the temperature sensor wires yet again right in that area where they all flex and in fact we are back in business uh, and these things they actually um, they print pretty quick so uh, they're they're starting to back up we've got uh, nearly a hundred of these things uh, uh, going now and uh, they are not bad and so now where where's my example here. Uh, well, I mean, we've got this one just so you can see what it's like uh, when they're, it's mounted by the brass standoffs holding it down. And in particular, all of the naughty bits, all of the pins are covered. Uh, uh, so I feel good about that. We'll see how long the current key master, the third key master, like the drummers for Spinal Tap, uh, actually manages to last. That's the hardware story. All right. Uh, in the software story last week, so we actually got intertile events working in the limited case when everything was really uh, perfectly all set up, and we took some video and measured the the actual air on the single tile on the loopback and achieved six milliair. Uh, uh, and six milliair means a tremendous amount of time, relatively speaking, is going into each. Uh, uh, a significant event each intertile event is taking a significant amount of time i didn't multiply it all out but it's a lot and you know this reminded me that uh 
Well, oh, yeah. And first, I just wanted to say uh, uh, thanks to all the folks who put nice comments on the video last week. Because, you know, it was kind of a tough thing to have uh, expectations really high and then saying, you know, oh, uh, thousands, we're talking thousands. So so John and Luke and Andrew and AJ, uh, you know, thank you. It, it, it actually helps a lot. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, part of it is just, again, this is what I said in the pilot episode of T Tuesday Updates, is that if you do it in public, Look, you can't wait until you get to the happy ending. You can't wait until everything looks good. You got to go when you got to go. And so that's what we did. And we've got additional information this week. Uh, um, so what I realized was, was that, you know, the lock, we went through this with the locking in July, uh, where they started out being like 300 milliseconds each, and we got it down to 150 microseconds, something like that. And in the process, we, we made this, you know, this slick buffer scheme where you could make lock events saying, grab this lock, release this pin, this one up, this one down, and so forth in a way that was much lower overhead than actually like printing messages to log files and stuff like that. Although Linux, tries hard to make printing the log files quick this was much quicker because it just built an internal buffer made little one word event notices and just bammed them down and then a separate program would read them from user space later and decode them and say oh, well, what it was and tell us here was the lock events and then uh, 10 microseconds later there was this and so on and so forth and so number one it was like, you know, well, we could use that. We could use the lock tracing to get a sense of where the time is going for the cache updates. Because now that we have inner tile working in loopback sense, it's got to be doing both locking and uh, packet updates. So uh, did some experiments with that. And, you know, so this is what the output from the user space lock tracing program. It's got, you know, just the event number first and then the relative amount of time uh, and then the, um, the absolute amount of time from the beginning of the trace, the relative amount of time from the previous event. This is one microsecond later than that. This is 19 microseconds later than that and so forth. Uh, and then uh, information about what the event was, you know, the the user, uh, the re request that the user made is done. So the right to the uh, from the right from user space is now returning and then a hundred microseconds later another right from user space came and so forth so this is a case where uh, the top part of it up to the w baku it was grabbing locks uh, it was freeing locks and then in the next one from here down it's grabbing a lock and so forth uh, and you know looking at this stuff while mfm t2 was running intertile stuff was running watson you know this popped out immediately uh, uh, you know microseconds 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 109 milliseconds 109 millisecond that's a hundred thousand microseconds you know add up all those u second things and they're a hill of beans compared to this one event that was 109 milliseconds after it and what it is is that right return success there is saying that the locks were successfully grabbed and this blocking right from user is the user space saying, okay, I'm done with the locks. So in fact, it's 109 milliseconds that's somehow getting used by the cache update process. And it's not actually the locks themselves. I mean, the locks themselves are dozens and hundreds of microseconds, which is never going to get us to hundreds or thousands of errors. But that's not the problem at the moment. The problem at the moment is the tenth of a second that is happening somehow for doing the packet update while you're holding the locks between grabbing the locks and releasing them so what i did is i went back and i and i re implemented a similar packet grab event grabbing system that uh, using the queues and all the same stuff that i had developed for the locks separately in the part of the kernel that's doing the packet update stuff so that we could see whenever user space sends a packet to linux or linux sends a packet to the prus the coprocessors that actually push the bits through the wires or when the coprocessors, the prus, send a received packet back to Linux, or Linux sends the received packet back to user space, because that's the pattern. In order to do a cache update, MFM T2 is sitting in user space. It sends a packet to Linux, to pru, to neighboring pru, to neighboring Linux, to neighboring MFM. That's how information moves. And so I built a packet thing, and then I extended the packet tracing guy so that it would it would consider events from both the locking queue and the packet queue and interleave them according to their actual time so we could see what was happening. Uh, um, but this pattern, a tenth of a second, 
uh, a tenth of a second, a tenth of a second. It was really reliable. It was like basically every event, or at least every event that involved grabbing locks, was taking like a tenth of a second. Now, that also meant that, you know, all of the time to do all of the events that didn't involve taking locks was like nothing. Uh, um, so I started to get it working. I was using angle bracket, southeast, two pru. Those are packet reports that got interleaved into the lock reports. And uh, very quickly, this is what jumped out. So up here, we've got, you know, from user. That means MFM is sending packets to Linux in order to ship out via the Prus. It's sending packets destined for the southeast. It's a four to eight byte packet, eight to 16 bytes. I don't get the exact uh, length of the packets because it didn't have enough room in the event tag. Uh, this is a begin, atom, 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 end. So that whole thing is a cache update. And they're all being sent, bam, 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 bam. But none of them are going from Linux to the Pru for another 54 milliseconds. That's incredible waste. Again, that's 54,000 microseconds compared to all of that stuff. And that's the pattern overall. Stuff was going from user space to Linux. Okay, it was reasonable. And then there was this huge delay. And it was sort of repeatably like 50 milliseconds plus or minus a little bit. And eventually the pin dropped. Eventually I got it. So this piece of code here, uh, this loop while go around, what it's doing is it's taking packets that have come from Linux, I'm sorry, that have come from user space and sending them off to the Prus. That's what ship current outbound packets does. And then it sleeps a little bit and it sleeps for 50 milliseconds, but that's supposed to be fine because uh, when any when, when a packet is actually written from user space to uh, the Linux kernel, the that process wakes up up. It, it says, you know, don't finish the rest of your sleep, get to work, send this thing out. Uh, um, so it, this 50 milliseconds is only supposed to be an absolute last minute timeout because explicitly what's going to happen is this thing is going to be woken up. And, you know, and so here's a routine, wake outbound packet shipper that calls this wake up process thing to explicitly get that guy to go and go around ship packets and so on. And this is what it looks like up here when the thing is actually getting called. Wake up outbound packet shipper, wake up the process, don't sleep for 50 milliseconds and so forth. No, that's not the way it works. <sighs> Finally, M sleep interruptible. Interruptible, interruptible is not wakeable by wake up process. The 50 millisecond wait was going to be a full 50 milliseconds, no matter how much packets were ready to be sent. That's where the time was going. Where does the time go? It's sleeping for 50 milliseconds before it's even considering sending packets that have arrived from user space off to the Prus. And what one needs to use, I eventually find out, is not M sleep interruptible, which is interruptible not in the wake up process sense, but schedule timeout. Uh, and I changed it to schedule timeout. And, you know, this was totally not obvious and as evidenced by the fact that I found this message from 2016 so you know it's it's not this year but it's not that old either uh, making an explicit change for the documentation to say that scheduled timeout will wake up when anyone calls wake up process because the documentation didn't used to say that it gave the impression that scheduled timeout wasn't going to wake up for anything and that's why you need absolutely been interruptible so We make this change, we build it all up. Here's what we have now. Look how fast it's going. 601.32, one time around. 602.52, 52 events in 80 seconds. 650 milliair. That one change, M sleep interruptible to schedule timeout, got us a factor of 100. So, <laughs> uh, uh, that's what it boils down to. Uh, it turns out that that same uh, misunderstanding, M-Sleep Interruptible, also applies in the 
uh, locking stuff. Um, I haven't fixed that yet because I just realized it while I was getting ready to do this update night. Uh, um, I think there's a reasonable chance and I've got some ideas about other possible improvements to do. It's going to take a little bit more work and more redesign. I think we'll have a reasonable chance to get to one air and that feels good after last week. The next update will be out in a week. Thanks for being here. Have a good week.